Перед кожним вилітом страх – це є нормою. Але важливо, щоб даний страх не приходив в паніку. This is footage inside the cockpit of a Ukrainian MiG-29 over the country's Kherson region. The mission? Defend two Ukrainian Su-25s from Russian fighters and air defenses as they make their attack runs. They're flying in the weeds, on the deck. In other words, dangerously close to the ground at more than 500 miles per hour. The pilot flies low to stay off Russian radar as long as possible. At 29, Major Vadim Voroshilov, call sign Karya, is already an experienced MiG-29 pilot and social media star. But even as Karya's skills as a pilot get him home safely, the Soviet-era tech in his MiG-29 makes it vulnerable to the more modern fighters of the Russian Air Force. Those planes sit at a higher altitude, ready to fire long-range missiles, targeted using long-range radar. According to Major Voroshilov, Russian fighters like this Su-35 and its variants can detect his MiG at 125 miles and can fire air-to-air -air missiles soon after. But he can only detect the Russian planes 45 miles out. Although these numbers can vary depending on the equipment, armament, and the types of jets used. This is also one of the main reasons Ukraine's President Volodymyr Zelensky has been lobbying the U.S. and its allies for American-made F-16 fighter jets. So this is one of the deficiencies that the Ukrainians are currently suffering from their MiG-29 fleet, is they simply don't have the kinds of radar capabilities that the F-16 possesses, which then allows the F-16 to employ air-to-air -air missiles at a much longer range than they currently possess. Чим довше будемо чекати, тим ми довше втратимо найкращих пілотів, котрі мають досвід і забувають перемогу в повітрі на недосконалій старій радянській техніці. Yet for months, the Biden administration refused the request for F-16s. Then, at the G7 summit in May, the White House gave European allies the go-ahead. So what changed? The turnaround, according to officials, comes amid concern that the war will continue this year and perhaps beyond. Ultimately, time's on Russia's side. If you're just involved in a slugfest that is ongoing on the ground, Putin doesn't care for, you know, the, the well-being of the people that he's exposing on the front lines. And so he'll just do another call up of another 300,000 um, folks. But as Zelensky and Kyiv celebrate the plan... And I want to thank you and all the partners about this decision, about training mission. It's really, really very, very important. U.S. officials are tamping down expectations. Uh, and F-16s, there's no magic weapons in war. Uh, and, and, and sometimes certain things uh, get labeled as, you know, this is going to be the magic weapon. There are no magic weapons. And F-16s not, neither is anything else and looking toward a longer-term solution for Ukraine's security. As we go forward, F-16s clearly have a role. Uh, Ukraine deserves a capable air force. It's going to take a considerable length of time to build up an air force that's uh, the size and scope and scale that'll be necessary. So how will F-16 training by European allies work? And will the F-16 be better than what Ukraine has now? I don't want to lend the impression that it's like hopping from a Chevy into a Ford into a Tesla no, it's not that simple. But on the other hand, it's not extraordinarily complex because they understand modern fighter aircraft. Where the time comes in is learning the new weapon systems, and it takes a bit of time. The most recent analysis was about four months to take a MiG-29 Su-27 trained pilot and get them able to effectively operate an F-16. And with this training, how could NATO F-16s be used in Ukraine? The war has devolved into an artillery slugfest that resembles World War I, and it's air power that is the one asymmetric advantage that can break this stalemate and fundamentally give Ukraine a decisive advantage over the Russians. <laughs>